Today we're going to be taking a look at the very first advent of view challenge for 2022. There is one of these challenges every day from the 1st of December to the 24th. I don't know if I'll be solving all of them, but I'll definitely be solving a few of the more interesting ones. We're going to go ahead and get started with the very first challenge. Basically the requirements are as follows. We have a very simple application and we need to fill out some of the requirements. At the moment we have a search bar that doesn't do anything and we aren't showing any results. What they would like us to do is every time we type in this input bar, we're going to make an API request, we're going to get some products, and then we're going to render them down here. We're also going to debounce this, so it's not going to make a request every time we type. It's going to wait for us to finish typing our search term, then it's going to make a single request. Finally, we're required to handle the loading states gracefully, so we're going to have a spinner. And if there's an error or there's no results, we're going to show an alert to inform the user that there was no results found. This is a very trivial application, but there's always many ways to solve these things. So I'm just going to show you how I work through this. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what the decisions I made. And then we may talk a little bit about how we're going to test this application as well. Let's go ahead and get started. The very first thing we're going to do is make our API request just to get an idea of the data that we're going to be dealing with. I'm going to go ahead and create a new variable here called API. And that's just going to be this endpoint, dummyjson.com slash products slash search. Every time we type in this search bar, search bar, we're going to make a request, and then we're going to take a look at what data we have. Just to get something working, let's go ahead and create a new function, and I'm going to call this one fetch products. I like my API request to start with fetch. I think it makes it clear what's happening, since generally you're going to be using the fetch API to request that data. The first thing we're going to do is create a new variable. We're just going to await for window.fetch. We're going to fetch from that endpoint, so the API, then we're going to pass in our query string, which is just going to be a value we pass in here as well, which I'm going to go ahead and call term. It's going to go ahead and pass this in. And the next thing we need to do is pass this into JSON. So we're going to say await res.json. Finally, I'm going to go ahead and do a console log on JSON just to get an idea of what we're working with. Finally, let's go ahead and call this one. We're going to fetch our products and I'm just going to search for phone. Let's save it off and give it a try. I head back to the browser now, we have got an API response. Let's take a look inside of the products key. We have a bunch of different data here. The ones we're interested in are going to be ID, price, and title. So we're going to go ahead and define an interface for those just to make sure everything is nice and type safe. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to start off with a new interface called product. It's going to have ID, which is a number. It's going to have price, which is a number. And we're going to have title, which is a string. Finally, we're going to extract it and return it from this function. So I'm just going to go ahead and say return res or json dot products. And we're going to typecast this to be a product array. Huh, not that one, we're going to get a product array. Finally, everything should be working as expected. And this function is more or less complete. We haven't actually written any of our view UI layer yet. This is just very simple business logic. And I want to keep this separate from my view integration. I just want this to be a nice, simple function. Now that we have that, the next thing we do is figure out what the next requirement is going to be. And we do have a few options here. We have to do our debouncing. We have to display our data down here. And that's probably where we're going to start. I'd like to get something displaying and then we'll work backwards with the debouncing and the load state and all that sort of thing. What we're going to need to do is have a variable to store this data. So let's go ahead and create a new variable. I'm going to create one here. I'm just going to call this one products. It is going to be a ref since it needs to be reactive and it is going to contain an array of product. And we're just going to start off with an empty array. The next thing we're going to do is update this every time we search for a value. So let's go ahead and use this function that provided here. I'm just going to go ahead and make this one asynchronous so I'm able to call a wait inside of it. We're going to go ahead and create a new variable here. I'm just going to call it, uh, let's say result. We're going to await for fetch products, passing in our term, which is going to be the new term. Now that we have that, we can go ahead and assign it to our products ref. So I'm just going to say products.value is equal to result. Finally, if we did everything correctly, we should be able to go ahead now and render this data down here. Let's go ahead and see if that one's working. We are going to use a v4 in here just to loop over those. We're going to say for product of products. Unfortunately, it didn't complete. Let's try one more time. We're going to be good citizens and pass in our key as you do. And then we're just going to go ahead and render the title and the price. So I'm going to say product.title and then we're going to go ahead and say the price. So product.price. With a bit of luck, everything should now be working correctly. Our initial search is going to be for phones. 
Let's head back to our browser and give it a try. If I refresh the page, I'm hoping to see something. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm not seeing anything. Let's see if the network request is actually getting made. Uh, and it certainly is, so I guess we've made a mistake somewhere along the line. Let's see if we can debug this. So what I was expecting is this to be requesting. It's going to make this request, uh, but it's not going to assign the values. The assigning only happens down here inside of watch. So what I'm going to do is actually delete this initial request. And if I type into my input, this should then be triggered. Let's go ahead now and give that one a try. If I start typing in here, let's say I search for car. It is actually going to make three requests, one for C, one for CA, and one for CAR. Uh, this is definitely not ideal, and this is why we want to debounce this. We only want to make one request, which is going to be for car. Either way, it looks like it's kind of working. <laughs> the requests don't look very relevant to car. I might go ahead and try a different one like phone. Uh, and these do look a whole lot better. So I think this is working correctly. I think it's just a kind of uh, strange test endpoint. Either way, this is displaying as I would expect. So the next thing we're going to do is see if we can deal with that debounce. There's a few ways to do debouncing. We could write our own function, but I really don't think it's worth the time or effort. What I would recommend doing, and what I generally do, is check view use to see if there's any good functions you can use from there. I had a look at view use earlier, and inside of view use core, I can go ahead and grab the use debug or use debounce function. And this is going to do exactly what you would expect. It's going to debounce this search. So let's go ahead and implement that one right now. What I need to do is make sure this inner function is going to be debounced. That's actually very easy to do. I'm going to grab my function and assign it to a new function. We're just going to say async function get products. And this is going to go ahead and be our initial function that we are going to debounce. With a bit of luck, this should just work as you would expect. Finally, now we have a new function out here, we're going to go ahead and debounce our watch. All I need to do is say debounce function. So let's go ahead and say use debounce function and pass in get products. And this should actually be working as you would expect. Watch is going to be called and every time search term is called, it's going to call this function here, which happens to be debounced. So it's only going to be called every uh, amount of time that we specify. I'm going to specify, let's say a thousand milliseconds now just for testing. So what I'm expecting is when I start typing, nothing is going to happen. After I stop typing and a thousand milliseconds pass, then it will make the request and get the products and finally assign them to that array. Let's go ahead now and give this one a try. If I head back to the browser and refresh the page, we have no requests. And you can see if I keep on typing, nothing is going to happen until I stop. I'm now going to go ahead and stop. And after a thousand milliseconds, it is going to make that request. And there is my data. Everything is working as expected, uh, which is definitely a good thing. We still haven't got the best user experience here. There's no load state, uh, so it's not entirely obvious what is going on, but the debouncing is working correctly. The next thing we're going to do is work on that user experience a little bit. We're going to have a loading flag and show a little spinner. To be able to show that flag, we're going to need a variable. So let's go ahead and define a new one. I'm going to call this one loading as you would expect. It's going to default to false. I've also prepared a little spinner just to save a little bit of time. So I'm just going to go ahead and import that one as well. I'll just show you how this looks really quickly. It is very simple. Uh, it's just a very basic SVG. I ripped off this website and then I put some nice styling in down here. So let's go ahead now and make sure we're rendering this whenever loading becomes true. So if we jump down here, we're going to do a conditional. I'm going to start off with my spinner and then we're just going to say V if loading. If loading is false, that means we have the data. So we can just go ahead and render our list using V else. Let's go ahead now and we could give this a try, but loading is always going to be false. So nothing would happen. What we need to do is set loading to be true when we're fetching the data and then toggle it back to false. I'm going to show you an incorrect way of doing this and then we're going to fix it up. So what you might expect to do is something like this. Jump inside of get products and say loading.value is equal to true. Finish requesting the data and then say loading.value is equal to false. Let's go ahead and see how this works. Come back to our browser. I'm just going to refresh to reset everything. And if we go ahead and start typing here, we can see we had to wait for a little bit before that spinner showed up, which is not really correct. What I would like to do is show that immediately as soon as the user stops typing, and then we're going to only hide it after the request has finished. The problem is this, we're setting the loading.value inside of get product, which is going to be debounced. So this is not going to become true for over a second, which is quite a significant amount of time for a user. It's definitely noticeable. What we really want to be doing is setting this value independently of this debounce function. So let's go ahead and do that. We can go ahead and use watch on the search term again, and in this particular case, we're going to set loading to be true immediately. 
So I can just go ahead and say loading.value is equal to true. Finally, the responsibility of resetting this value is going to belong to get products. As soon as this request finished, we're going to go ahead and say loading is equal to false. And this should solve our problem. Let's go ahead and give this another try and see if it's working. If I start typing, we're immediately loading, which does make sense. We are waiting for something. If we finish typing, it's going to make our request and then render our data. And this is a much better user experience. We did have to use two watches, but I, I really have no problem with this. I actually kind of like the symmetry here. We are watching the same search term, but we're doing drastically different things. The first one is concerned with the load state, and the second one is concerned with the debounce function. So I actually argue this is potentially more readable and a little bit better. Uh, there are many ways to accomplish this, but I'm pretty happy with this. Another decision I made was to put the loading state inside of get products, as opposed to putting it inside of fetch products. And I made that decision very deliberately. I see fetch products has been decoupled from my user interface layer and from view. It's just making a request with plain old JavaScript. I have all of my reactivity down here. I'm assigning product value and loading value. And I feel like this is more concerned with the user interface experience and the user interface layer. And this is more concerned with my business logic. And I really like this separation between fetch products and get products. I'm going to move, finally move this variable up the top. <laughs> I like to group all my variables together. And I'm pretty happy with the current state of this application. Everything is working almost as expected. The final thing we need to do is make sure we're showing an alert if there was no values found. So for example, if I type in dog and nothing is returned, or dig also uh, actually does return something, I know that dog doesn't, we should be showing an alert here. So let's go ahead and do that. This is going to be a fairly easy one. We can do it inside of get products. Uh, so we can just go ahead and show a value dynamically depending on products.value. What we can do is another watch, and this time we could do a watch on products. Depending on this result, we could go ahead and change the value. So I could say new products in here. And if this is going to have a length of zero, we're going to just go ahead and show an alert. So I can say if new products.length is equal to zero, let's just go ahead and do window.alert. And I'm going to say no products were found. Please try again. Let's go ahead now and give this one a try. Head back to our browser. And if we type in dog, which we had has no results, we are getting that alert. Everything is working as expected. And this brings us to the end of the requirements for this particular application. Everything is working as expected. Uh, we could leave it here, but I would like to do a little bit of testing. Uh, so we're going to continue on now and have a little look at how we might be able to test this application. Welcome back. We're now going to be talking about how we can test this application. As we saw, this application is very, very simple and trivial. So I don't see a ton of value in writing a bunch of simple unit tests because there's just not enough complexity here to warrant having granular unit tests. I'm going to test this entire thing using Cypress and a component test. You could use vtest or jest or playwright or whatever you want. The ideas and concepts are going to be the same. I'm just more comfortable and familiar with Cypress. So that's what I'm going to be using. I've already opened up Cypress and I'm going to go ahead and create my new test from app PsyTS. Uh, now that we've got that, we are rendering our application and there's two basic states we need to test. There's going to be the, the scenario where we fetch some products and render them. And there's going to be the scenario where nothing is returned and we're going to show an alert. Let's go ahead and start with the former where the application products are successfully requested. So let's head over to our spec now and get started. The first thing we're going to do is mount our application or our component, which we are already doing. So the next thing we're going to need to do is type into our search box. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm just going to go ahead and grab my input and we're going to search. In fact, what we're going to do is have these side by side, just so you can see what's going on while you develop. Uh, I think this is probably going to be the best workflow. So the first thing we're going to do is search for our input. Then we're going to go ahead and type into it. I'm going to type in phone, which I happen to know returns some results and that is working as you would expect. This is making a real request to a real API, uh, which might not be ideal. We'll talk about that in just a moment, but let's go ahead and get the test passing first. So we did successfully get our data. So the next thing we're going to do is assert that the correct number of items is rendered. I can just go ahead and say sci.get. We're going to grab those from the, the list and I'm just going to grab all of the children and this should have a length. So it should have a length. Let's go ahead and assert that one or have length rather, and it should be four in this particular case. If I did everything correctly, this should hopefully be passing. And there we go. Uh, just to make sure it's really passing for the right reasons, I'm going to make it fail. And that is going to fail. I said five when it's supposed to be four. And of course that did fail. 
Uh, the next thing we're going to do is write the other test where it shows the alert. And then we're going to talk about how we can deal with this external third party API. And if we really want to be hitting this during our tests. Let's go ahead and create a new test. Uh, and this one's going to be a little bit more interesting. So I'm just going to use it only to focus on that one. Uh, while we're here, we're going to rename these. I'm going to say it fetches some products. And in this particular case, I'm going to say it doesn't, it shows an alert. So it shows, shows an alert when no products are found. If we go ahead now and just get rid of these two, we should have our application back. Now what we need to do is make sure we're searching for something that has no results. In this case, we're going to search for dog, which I happen to know has no results. And finally, we're going to assert that the length is going to be uh, zero in this particular case. So let's just go ahead and do that. Uh, this is in fact going to pass, uh, which is great. Uh, but what we really want to be doing here is also asserting that we're correctly showing an alert. And that's what we are doing here. We are showing that alert. Uh, we just need to make sure we're asserting against that correctly. And this is also quite easy to do with Cypress. What I'm going to do is stub out the alert. So I'm going to go ahead and say uh, Cy.on. We're going to look for the alert. I can just use window.alert. Then we're going to grab the value inside of here. And uh, we're not actually stubbing this. We're going to intercept it and make an assertion. I'm just going to do a console log and show you what we're working with here. Let's go ahead now and open up the console. And you can see it's actually giving us the value. So what we can go ahead now is, and do is just write an assertion. I'm just going to expect the value to be or rather to equal and then pass in my expected error message. Finally, let's save it off and see what happens. That is going to pass. Uh, again, just to make sure it's going to pa fail when it should be, I'm going to change this to be a different value and this one should be failing and so it is. We can see we're getting the wrong error message there. So now we have all of our tests passing, definitely a good thing. What we need to do is figure out what we're going to do with this third party. Uh, in this particular scenario, I have absolutely no problem with actually hitting a third party endpoint. And the reason is this, uh, this endpoint, you might say, well, what if it's broken? It's going to break my tests, which is true, uh, but it's also going to break your production application because you are relying on a third party. Uh, of course, this is not always going to be a valid testing strategy, especially if the third party is requiring you to have things like paid API requests or has a rate limit. Uh, so what we're going to do is see an alternative strategy, which is going to be using Cypress intercept. What we can do is jump up here and do Cy intercept. We're going to intercept uh, our endpoint and then we're going to return some different data. Uh, so in this particular case, we're going to make sure we're intercepting the correct endpoint, which is going to be this dummyjson.com. Let's just go ahead and copy and paste that one head back here and we're going to intercept that. Uh, finally, we're going to have a search term. So I'm just going to use this uh, asterisk and then we can choose what we'd like to return in here. In this case, we can go ahead and just say body and return whatever we'd like. I'm going to go ahead and return products. Uh, we're just going to make this empty for now, which is hopefully going to give us a failure. It's going to fail for the right reasons. Uh, we're not actually writing, running the right test anymore. Let's go ahead and fix that one up. And this one is going to fail. And this does make sense. Uh, because we're not returning any products anymore. If we do look at the network tab, we're actually going to see this request is getting made, uh, but it's not actually hitting that endpoint. Cypress is going to intercept it under the hood and return us our alternative response. Uh, so this is working as you would expect. And what you could do at this point is go ahead and return whatever you like. So for example, you could say ID is one. Uh, let's just go ahead and see if it works. Title could be dog and price could be, uh, let's just say a hundred. And if it's working correctly, we are going to see that is doing what you would expect. Uh, just as an example, I'm going to get rid of that. And we're going to do something very similar down here. Uh, this is probably a better candidate for an empty response since that's exactly what we want to be doing here. Uh, let's go ahead now and save this off. Uh, we're going to execute both of our tests. And with a bit of luck, this one should be working. And they're both going to pass. The first one is using a real endpoint and the second one is using intercept. Of course, you can go ahead and decide the correct strategy based on your application and your testing scenario. Either way, we have exercised the entire application and I'm fairly confident everything is working as expected. One thing we didn't do is assert that the spinner is being rendered correctly. I might just leave that one as an exercise since it's fairly straightforward and fairly trivial to do. Uh, this does bring us to the end of the first advent of view challenge. Uh, I'll see how people respond to this and if they find it enjoyable. And if I see any more interesting challenges, I might go ahead and share my solutions for those as well. Uh, if you work through this and have a solution, please share it with me. I'd love to compare and see how other people have solved this problem. Either way, I'm going to leave this one here and I will see you in the next video.